Hello, um, I'm Dominic Beasley. Um, for the past four or five years, I've been playing around with various um, different what-if scenarios with old BBC hardware. Um, and sort of the way I got to where I am at the moment was I started developing uh, a what-if scenario of what if a BBC had had a 6809 processor instead of 6502. And I developed like a single board computer with a lot of add-on boards. Um, and I developed a MOS and ported BASIC and kind of got that working. And it was, it was quite interesting. It's not much faster than normal BBC. It was, I quite like programming as 6809 instead of 6502. And then I thought, well, actually, it's not that much better. It would be a lot more expensive to produce. Um, and then I sort of went down the rabbit hole of thinking, well, what if instead of developing ARM, which I'm not saying they shouldn't have done, what if Acon had gone more like the MOS route and developed a chipset? to do loads of funky graphics and sound and all that kind of stuff that the Amiga chipset did. Um, and I kind of then got hold of, I think it was a zero page and a Godil and a, I can't remember the other um, CPLD and I tried poking that into the CPU socket and developing some stuff. And from there it's grown into, I'm now on a Mark II board of this Blitter and it's got several aspects to it um, that kind of emulate what an Amiga does, but in a BBC-centric sort of way. So the main board of the computer is still a plain old BBC B or Master or Elk or even an Atom, but then it has some coprocessors that rather than running on the tube, um, run in the CPU socket so they can take over the entire system. Um, this allows some some really fast graphics that you, I, I, I sort of caught the end of the, the conversation we were just having before about the, you know, poking stuff over the tube and the stuff that Rob C's been doing, which is brilliant. Um, but he's still kind of limited that there's got to be a bit of code sat on the, on the BBC, basically um, moving the bytes from one place to another. So it's kind of limited by the speed of the 6502 and how fast it can, poke stuff to the screen whereas the the actual graphics memory in the bbc if you can hit it at two megahertz you can do some really fa fancy stuff and then the other aspect was the amiga sound i always thought that but back in the day that was like you know really was the dog's bollocks of of computer sound i think um and it the way it was done is quite clever in that the um you got four notes that you could set at different sample rates which meant the CPU was doing barely any work to produce some really quite good sounding music. Um, so I, I, I started playing about with this, mainly just a, it's, it's a big FPGA that sits in the CPU socket that pretends to be the CPU. And then I started, went down another rabbit hole of, well, what if there were different processors? So the, the Mark I and Mark II boards have sockets for that allow you to also have a Z80, a 6809, or a 6808 processor as the main processor. Um, I kind of gave myself some constraints of, I think it, it should be realistic for the mid to late 80s. Um, that kind of limits some of the stuff you can do. So some of the stuff people have been doing re recently, which is really interesting with the um, Pi shoved into the tube socket or whatever, it's great, but it's, some of the stuff's really not realistic for the 80s because the, the Pi is basically running at you know, gigahertz plus speeds. Um, and I, I, the first board, I start, I've even started saying, well, it should be through whole components for the main things other than the CPLD, which is kind of pretending to be a ULA. I, I kind of relax those constraints after a while because the through whole components are becoming more difficult to source and five volt stuff is becoming difficult so in the end i kind of relaxed the rules a bit and i allowed myself three volt parts 
and lots of surface mount. But I still think that the, the ideas are stuff that would have been possible in the mid 80s, even if they'd probably been quite expensive or, or stupidly um, you know, out of the scope of somebody like Acorn. Um, so, all right, so I just want to share the screen. I don't know who shares screen. Um, Right, can everybody see a PowerPoint yes. slide? Cool. So this is where I've kind of got to these days, which is um, there's a BBC Micro over there on the right of the screen. And that can be, um, I've tried this, it, it, it kind of works in an electron. It works, uh, it, it worked more or less first time in the electron. There were physical issues, which I'll talk about later. Um, in the master, I had to make a little interface board because I'd not thought through voltage levels and the master's all on CMOS. So it got quite upset by some of the voltage conversion. It wasn't quite beefy enough for the master. Um, so there's a little interface board that, that goes in the plug. But I needed an interface board anyway because the master, the CPU is the other way around. So to fit it inside the box, I needed a 90 degree turn anyway. Um, and I've also tried it briefly in the Atom, and I kind of got something working in the Atom, uh, but I d I've not pursued that to any great level. But the, the stuff towards the left is more the meat of what we're going to look at today. So, so I'll probably stick with the stuff that's in the middle. So this is the stuff that's in the FPJ, which is kind of doing the things that the Amiga chipset does. So I think you can see there, there's DMAC at the top, which is like a, a DMA controller, which is just a way of transferring memory really quickly. Um, so it has, um, in things like the Amiga and various other systems, you have direct memory access, which allows um, the DMA controller sort of sets the address of something, and then the hardware pokes the memory directly into memory. So it, you can transfer data really quickly. This one can't quite do that on the BBC because it's not set up for it, but what it does is it, it acts as a pro coprocessor that's just really set up for doing fast copies. So what it does is it, it takes over from the CPU and it just does data transfers at flat out speed. Then there's the blitter. That is for um, moving graphics about it really, really quite quickly. So it, um, it um, I don't know if any people sort of know the Amiga, but one of the, the big parts of what makes it what it is, is its ability to, to move gra graphics about quickly. It's, this process is not actually that quick, but it seems quite quick when you're playing games because it's, it's got this Blitter coprocessor, which is really good at moving graphics about. The BBC presents some, some challenges there because um, of the way that the display memory is laid out with, it's really a character-based display with bitmap graphics overlaid on it. Um, so the blitter has to do quite a bit of jumping through hoops to work out where it is when it wants to draw the next dot. Um, the next part is the sound chip, which, like I say, it's almost an identical copy of what the Amiga does. Uh, there's a memory controller that's basically, at the moment, it doesn't do a lot other than provide sideways RAM access to the chip RAM and the flash ROM. Um, there's bus control, which is just like logic for arbitrating between the system and memory buses. And there's a thing called the Aeris, which is Latin for copper. And if anybody's familiar with the Amiga, it had a coprocessor that did really fancy raster graphics stuff. So it, it's, it's like um, some of the demos that have been coming out recently where people are chasing the raster and doing stuff at specific instance in time to keep up with the beam drawing the graphics. This makes it a lot easier. It's just basically a really simple, CPU that is timed to follow the um, the beam as it goes along the tracing out the graphics. So you can set, I'm going to wait until I'm on line 25, position six across the screen, and then I'm going to poke one of the palette registers. Sorry, as usual, my phone's just started ringing. I'll just have to turn that off. Sorry about that. Um, and then on the far left of the screen, there's some RAM and ROM. Now, again, the, the RAM's kind of breaking my, it's got to be realistic for the 80s. You probably wouldn't have been able to afford two megabytes RAM, but you don't have to use it all. We can pretend. And then the flash ROM is quite big as well. 
Uh, the reason I did a big flash run was that um, you can switch between a 6502 processor and one of the other processors, and it's quite handy to have a different set of ROMs for the two. Um, so there's space there to have a full set of ROMs for both processors and just flick a switch and switch between on the other. Anyway, that's enough talking. I just want to show you some, some sort of quick demos of what this actually looks like. So to do that, I'm going to have to try and um, switch my screen. So I don't know how, I, how do I stop sharing? Can people still see the slide or can you see a BBC Micro? We can, can see, see a BBC Micro now. Excellent, good. Right, so the first thing I did was a quick test out of the Blitter. Um, so what it does here is it loads a big font into memory and does a, a, a scroll text. Um, so I'll just start this going. I'll just talk through it while it's running. Um, I may have problems with the filing system here. I'm using a um, host FS over a serial cable and every now and again it gets its knickers in the knot, but I think it seems to be working now. Here we go. So here's some, you know, it's pretty basic scroll text, but I think this would probably be quite difficult to achieve on a raw BBC micro, or some of the stuff that's been coming out recently has been mind-blowingly good. So I, can you see that? Is it is it horribly flickery or is it easy to See. It's a bit flickery, I suppose. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's okay. It's okay. All right. It's a bit jumpy. It's, it's, it's okay. Zoom doesn't do it justice. Um, this is running at 50 frames a second. So on a CRT, it looks amazingly smooth and um, nice compared to most stuff. I mean, it's, and I'll just talk you through, through some of the stuff it's doing. So here it's, it's, it's writing all of the font once every screen. Um, but it's also copying the entire screen from a, a, a background buffer onto the screen 50 times a second. So when the Blitter or the DMA controller are running flat out, they can copy to the graphics memory at roughly 2 megahertz. So it's, it takes half a 50, you know, a hundredth of a second to copy a, an entire Mode 2 screen. Um, of course, the colors are great here as well because it's using Rob's Neula to do the palette. Um, so, uh, I don't know what else to say about this one. Um, oh yeah, and the, the other thing that the blister does is when you're plotting sprites with it, so each of these, um, the letters is basically a sprite, and as it plots it, it will save what's underneath it to another buffer. So, instead of it just starting with a blank screen each time and writing the text, it's actually writing the text out, copying the screen to the real, copying the background screen to the real screen, and then unplotting all of the text before it replots it again, scrolled along a bit. So in the real world, you probably wouldn't do it like that, but it's just to test out how quickly the hardware could work. So I was, I was quite, quite, this was the first thing I sort of did, and I was quite amazed that, wow, you can actually, with something like this, you could do this. Um, this is with the CPU, I think on this demo is running at two megahertz. Some of the other demos, if the program is in the chip RAM, depending on what CPU is running, it can run at 8 megahertz as well, or up to 8 megahertz. So some of the processors we've got there, like the 68008, when it says it's running at 8 megahertz, effectively it's really running at 2 megahertz. It takes four or five cycles to do, to fetch, do one memory fetch. Um, so I think we'll do questions at the end, so I'll, I'll not... Um, blather on about this anymore and I'll show you something else. So I can't remember which disk is which. Uh, so the next thing I thought I'd have a go at was line drawing. So this is really a, very much a work in progress. Um, I sort of started this middle of last year and I, I've never properly finished it off. This requires me to run as uh, a 6809. Uh, basically, so I just wrote the software for the 6809 because it was easier. So if I'll reboot, and now we are running, this is a, now the main processor is a real 6309 processor. Um, so I've ported a few things here. Like I said, I ported basic, I ported the MOS, which is basically unfinished, but it 
you can do most things and a couple of filing systems so it's got the host fs filing system um potted across as well um what we'll look at here is i did some line drawing code so the next thing that a lot of the graphics accelerators do is um taking over the plot code so this is has got a hacked moss in it which instead of using its own plot routines uses the hardware acceleration of the blitter to do some line plotting so i'll try and load the right program so here's a really quick and simple test program which see there that's the uh, moss drawing lines in its usual using its usual code so it takes about four and a half seconds to draw 20 of those spirals um, and if i turn the graphics acceleration on oh it's not star tv star fx sorry run it again hopefully it'll go somewhat faster so it's roughly three and a bit times faster um like i said this is unfinished and the the main thing i really wanted to get working with that was some triangle plotting because then we could do some really fancy um i probably need help because i'm not that great a programmer but porting elite to actually have solid shapes rather than um just lines exclusive odd to the screen um like i say the the i think this is still realistic for a 1980s computer the the amiga had stuff like that this in it um pc graphics cards were starting to have stuff like that this in it and you know in the 70s some of the high-end workstations had these these kind of things in it um the next thing if i can show you is the um music -y stuff so i'll need to swap back to being a 6502 again and reboot i'll just be a second i've got to find the switch so i'm sure some people have probably seen this already because i've posted up um the polar chip i've also done a version for hoglet's um one megahertz bus cpld card and i've posted up uh, BBEM and BM emulators with the just the sound card part in it, um, which both work. So if you if you want to play with this Pro Tracker stuff when you finish, those are available somewhere on the forum. Uh, so let me just start this up. Now this may sound awful over Zoom. I've not really tried this, so tell me if it's just an awful racket. But I'll just start a tune playing. So, can you, I don't know if you can still hear me off, that's too loud. I might just turn it down a wee bit. I've lost my turning down knob. Uh, could, you, could, you, could anybody actually hear that and can you hear me over the top of it? Yeah, I think you turned it down a bit too much. I okay. think you turned it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It's got some huge 1940s speakers on it at the moment, so it sounds very loud here, but. I'm sure I'm even louder. Um, so what this is doing, it's, a, it's an unmodified um, Amiga Pro Tracker song that's been played by a tracker player that's written in 6502 Assembler. And it, it can run with, it can do this and it can do other stuff at the same time. So there's, there's a few like little gadgety things on here that don't really do much. Um, but it would be possible to get this playing in the background of a game quite easily. Um, the real constraint on that is how you shuffle the memory about because the the songs on bit themselves are quite large so they can be up to like a megabyte in size you need to be able to see about 4k of it at a time to be able to get the pattern into memory and then the rest of it's just poking hardware counters i'm gonna stop this because i can't hear myself think um and like i say the the way that the amiga sound chip worked which is different to modern sound cards is that most modern sound cards what they do is they they will play samples at a fixed rate say 48 kilohertz and the cpu has to do a lot of shuffling around and dsp to then if you want to play different notes to stretch or compress the samples in time domain before poking them to the hardware card whereas the amiga chip what it did was had four independent channels and you could load a, a sample into each channel 
and then just play it at different rates and set the volume and the, the sample rate on each channel independently. So for different notes, all you had to do was poke two bytes to a hardware um, register. Whereas if you're doing it with DSP, you have to do you know, hundreds of thousands of calculations a second. So it can, like I said, this is a 6502 program running at two megahertz and it's got CPU cycles to spare doing this. So I was, again, I was quite impressed why Wow, if, if we'd had something like this, it would have been. Um, so is that Simon? Do you, do, is it me you want to show more more lists of files? <laughs> yeah, Mr. Farty. Um, so yeah, I've, I, I can't right, really... just we, we, we're sort of running slightly over time. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll 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 uh, try and get. Have you have you got any, anything else to demo? Because I don't really want to cut you off if you have. Yeah, no, I have. So I just wanted to show the the, the Ares thing, which is a excellent. Of, yes, please. Okay, I'll just do that. So I'll have to remember which just gets on. So let's go. So here's something showing the Ares thing running. So I'll just look this up. So as you can see here, what it's doing is it's doing some blitting to get the big writing on the screen and the owls flying past but then it's halfway along the line and on different lines it's changing the palette so it's poking stuff into the palette registers at the start of the line and in the middle of the line and again at another position in the middle of the line to get the, the colors changing in the middle so you can see the like the rainbow background that's just one color and the palette's been poked about in the uh, background um those are the only things I really wanted to demo. I don't know if we're, you know, I've, I've talked for quite a long time as usual. Um, I really wanted to show the boards themselves, but I, I guess that's, that will do for the demo. Um, is there anything anybody wanted to see again or ask about? Yeah, is, I was just going to ask, is there an editor, a ProTracker editor? Sorry, Not, um, you can't but, see me, but yeah. Uh, for, uh, yeah, is it... Does anything like that exist on the BBC? No, I mean the, this right. is the first time we've been able to play Pro Trackers, but oh, um, right. they, they're just standard Pro Tracker files, so you can edit them on an Amiga or there's loads. Yeah. There's a PC um, program for it. I wonder if somebody could, um, if that would be possible. Well, if somebody would need a that'd be quite cool. One of these cards, and then they'd need the time to do it. it it's um, yeah. the editor itself. Really impressive. Mm. If you look at the editor the code itself is, is quite an involved piece of code, the editor itself. So right. you could maybe start with the source code for ProTracker 23, which I think is GPL'd and you can get hold of, but it's, it's a big old program. Yeah. I quite like the idea of being able to edit mods in teletext. <laughs> <laughs> that quite appeals. <laughs> yeah. But that's Mr. really impressive. That, that'd be good. Mm. So, is, uh, yeah, okay. All right. So, this is a board you put your BBC mic. Sorry, I came in a bit late. I don't know everyone to, but it's sort of board you put your BBC micro, is it, or something? Yeah, it just sits in the CPU yeah. socket. So, I'll, I'll just. Um, I'll Sorry to. I'll, I'll read about it because you've already done your demo. But to, I don't know if you can um, 15 minutes. see my webcam I, now. This, this is right, kind of okay. what the board looks like. So, this yeah. is the master version, which has mm. got the extra bit on to. Um, if you can see on the back, it ro rotates the chip around by 90 degrees because the mm -hmm. cpu socket is the, a different way around in the master so can um, you can you hold that up again because i don't think yeah sorry the light's break. really bad in yeah, here so let's turn I all see. the lights off to um interesting mm. so it's Crack quite big it? and half of the yeah. board is taken up so sort of down this side uh these parts actually i've got if we've got time i've got somewhere in here So that's how it started out Blimey. five or six years ago. <laughs> this is a Mark One board, um, and here, well, this is a, this is a, the board as it stands at the moment. So, in the the big square in the middle is where the FPGA sits, and I used a WaveShare board because they were cheap and cheerful from AliExpress. I bought ten of those, I think, mm. in case anybody wanted one of these. Um, but you can see there, there's there's the sockets for the CPUs. Um, you can run it without any CPU at all because it's got a soft 6502 in the FPGA. That's the plug that plugs into the motherboard. So you can either have the plug on top, which is the way this one is, because it's an electron version. 
the BBC version, it's got the plug on the bottom and plugs straight on top of the CPU. Um, th there's the memory chips. That's where the FPGA sits. And these are like the configuration. And um, it's also got pins for putting up one of Dave Banks debugging systems on it. Wow. Anybody else got any questions? The thread for this then, Dominic, is um, is the blitter for the Beeb thread, is it? That's right, yeah. There's some stuff in a 6809 thread, but most of it's in the blitter thread. So I've posted up a few things recently. I, I, I've had a six-month hiatus. We moved house, and I've just been decorating this workshop that I'm sat in at the moment. But um, the thing I'm probably going to work on next is getting um, some master-type memory stuff working for the Model B. Um, so like the Hazel stuff on the master so that you can have page at EOO when you start up because uh, I think it's one of the most useful things and then I'm gonna start playing about with seeing if I can speed up ADFS um, hard disk transfers using the DMA controller and maybe even tube transfers. So one of the things I did a few years ago was porting Linux to Spro's um, ARM coprocessor but the thing that really limited it was it took about 15 minutes to start up because just copying the x megabytes of code across the tube takes a while um, but I think with the blitter you could basically have one megabyte per second transfers from a hard disk which in modern terms isn't very fast but in you know is a lot faster than the BBC does it and uh, then a, f a network card that I've been working on as well will be fast um, Right, just to say, while I remember as well, I've been working on a version of BM, so people can, if they want, download a copy of that. I'll put that on the thread at some point in the next week. Oh, it's wow. definitely, yeah, definitely splendid stuff. I just, um, what, what would the possible future be for people getting these boards? Are you thinking of becoming a manufacturer or not? I don't know. I'm a, I, when I made the part one board, I, I made a couple. I don't think I've ever plugged them in, so I, I kind of lost heart in making boards um, due to lack of interest. But I have to say, when the Mark Bond one board didn't really do much. Um, well, it did. It did all the stuff that this one does. But, I, but uh, when I sent them out, I probably sent them out a bit prematurely and didn't really explain them properly. Um, I think probably what I'll do is I'll, I'll probably develop this a bit further because uh, most of the work now is software. Is there's utility ROM that needs to go with it to make it work. And then there's a load of operating system stuff to make it work. And then I think probably the next version of the board, I'll make a cheaper version, which is, has just got one CPU socket. Cause a lot of the cost of the board is the, the real estate for the CPU sockets. And I, I'm not sure, I, I, don't, I don't know the feeling, but I think most people probably don't want to put a 68,000 chip in a CPU socket if they want to do that by an Amiga. Um, maybe one of the do. things you you could do um, is to uh, hard solder uh, small surface mount variations of the CPUs. So there's certainly a quad flat pack version of the 65 CO2 available. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the Z80 comes in a quad flat pack. I don't know about the 68000 series or the 6809. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was a thought. Um, the the reason it it is the way it is at the moment is you can only have one hard CPU at a time. So um, to get multiple CPUs and switch between them would require quite a bit more work. Whereas at the moment it, it, it will work with a, a CPU and a soft CPU. So you can switch between a 6809 and a 6502 like I just did, but having them all on the same board at the same time require, would require a lot more switching logic. Whereas at the moment it's just one socket works at a time. Uh, and all the other ones put out random single signals on their pins. Um, but what I was thinking is one one plug and a daughter board if you wanted the CPUs and then, or, or maybe nothing else. And there's, there's some expensive stuff on there, like there's a CMOS RAM, which probably most people don't need. And the battery back memory is possibly overkill. So I could probably cut it to half the size and make it a bit cheaper. But I, I don't know what the interest would be. I mean, I, I don't know how many people would want one of these. Um, I think until people have got them, nobody will develop the software. And then until people have developed the software, nobody will want one. So maybe the emulator route first is the way to go. 
Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, yeah, sorry uh, to have gone over that. by so no, much. No, no, you, you, you're 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 on time actually, exactly two o'clock, um, and it was uh, it was fascinating. Um, you, you don't know, but Dave and I were having a chat about uh, your overrunning, and we both came to the conclusion it was too interesting to interrupt you. So uh, <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you very much, much indeed. <laughs> thank you.